Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. We're going to be talking about a coffee love affair today. Um, so we put together a couple of really fun kind of sweetheart drinks for you all. Um, so we'll be talking through how to make those. Just going to kind of ease into tonight, though. And I just love to always like care about what everyone is drinking right now as we kind of settle in and get ready to talk about coffee. We're going to talk a little bit about wine, which is going to be fun. So I'm drinking a house-made kombucha here at the Wellmet Cafe. I'm, uh, it's made by one of our teammates at Onyx. It is a Cascara kombucha, which I really love. Um, I also like to feel like I'm drinking wine, even if I'm not. So I kind of like to do it in the, in the wine glass. So if you want to put into the comments, just like, what are you drinking right now? Or what have you enjoyed drinking today? That would be great. So Awesome. I'll formally introduce myself. I am Andrea Allen. I'm one of the co-founders of Onyx Coffee Lab. I'm the 2020 U.S. Barista Champion. I am the 2021 uh, World Barista Champion, second place. Um, and I also, I just love coffee. Um, I love beverages of all kinds. And so, yeah, we're coming to you today by way of Breville and Crate and Barrel. Thank you to those two uh, folks for like helping make this series possible. So all spring, we're going to be doing a class every month where we're going to be coming to you with a couple of really fun signature drinks. We're going to be talking through like just how to make those drinks, how to prepare the ingredients for those drinks. Um, and yeah, just talking about beverages in general. So if you're like me and you like love beverages or you love having folks over to your house or maybe you work in hospitality and you're kind of just trying to think about ways to like help engage your guests and their experience either at your dinner table or in your cafe or restaurant. Um, these are really fun series to follow along with. And um, one of the great things about all of the drinks I always make is that there's always lots of different options um, that you can like kind of sub in and out in terms of coffees, in terms of what kind of like milk or plant-based beverage you're using, colors, quantities, sizes, cupware, all of that stuff. So um, I usually like to kind of throw some of those things in. So thank you all so much for joining me today, and I am just super excited. Um, so we're going to start off by doing the strawberry cappuccino. Um, and so today, it, for both of these drinks, we're going to be using these really great glasses that are called um, Edge. And they're, thank you, for Crate and Barrel, for sending these to me. Um, and so kind of the, the thought process here is that like, we're going to do two different drinks in the same glass. Um, and the thought is that like, you know, at some point we're going to have a little toast. And for me, I feel like that, um, two people rarely like love the same thing. So in this scenario, I've made like a coffee drink and a champagne or a pet mat sparkling wine in the other, just thinking through like the, you know, it's great to have like two uh, cups that are the same, but also having two different drinks to kind of like think about meeting folks where they are. Some people like don't drink coffee. Um, whoa, I know it's true, but some people don't. Um, and some people don't, don't drink wine. Some people like want to, you know, do a little toast, but um, maybe they have completely different tastes. So in this like iteration, the goal is like, hey, let's like have two really fun drinks same glass, like, you know, made to be cheers, made to enjoy together, um, but completely different in terms of how they're made, their different temperatures, um, completely different drinks, but they do go together. So we'll start with the strawberry, uh, the strawberry cappuccino. And I want to talk just a little bit about the preparation and some of the ingredients before we really jump in and start making the drink together. I hope you're making it somewhere while you're watching this is really fun. Um, but yeah, I always get lots of questions about like, where do you get these ingredients? How do you make these ingredients? Um, and so for us, we really try to make a lot of the ingredients ourselves, just in terms of like things like syrups or flavorings, color components, uh, things like that. Obviously not every single thing can be made in house. Um, but for me, I feel like that mastering like the basics of making a syrup is like really straightforward, but then it can be like applied into all different kinds of categories. Um, so I want to talk about the strawberry syrup that we made. So basically we took uh, four cups of strawberry, um, 
strawberries, a cup of sugar. We had a little like splash of almond extract in it um, and some lemon and some lemon juice. So that basic component is going to be like your basic kind of like uh, set up for any kind of syrup that you might want to do. So you've got um, like a one to four ratio in terms of like the syrup and the fruit. You've got like a little bit of lemon juice to help give it like kind of that citrus pop. It'll also help with its like um, its lifespan. Uh, having a little bit of citric acid in, in anything just helps it like live a little bit longer and remain vibrant. And then the almond extract is just like a deeper kind of like um, spice, like richness. It's just going to add like a full rounding out of, of the syrup. So basically you're just going to like cut up your strawberries in whatever way you want to, throw everything together in a pot. Um, also there's water in there. Forgot about the water. Um, put some water in there and there's like, there's a, there's like a real specific ingredients list that I believe everybody already has. So basically you just put all that together and you're just going to cook it down until it gets super liquefied. So the thought process here is just like get everything together. Um, let the berries like really break down and release all of their juices. Um, get everything like stirred up really good so that that sugar completely dissolves, let it cool. And then you're going to pour it through like a fine mesh, um, straining sieve, or you could even pour it through. Actually, I would recommend a sieve on the strawberry one because, um, if you do something like a cheesecloth, it's going to be too fine. Uh, I think it'll just take too long for it to come out. But basically this is going to yield a really nice strawberry syrup. That's going to be sweet, flavorful, have that like tart citrus pop a little bit, the deepness of the almond extract. And it's just going to, um, work really great with coffee. Um, this syrup would also work really great with the pet nut sparkling wine we're going to use in the other drink. Um, this like kind of syrup is something that you could put with a lot of different things, I think. So, um, I always recommend like just playing around with syrups. I think they're really fun. Um, and if you made that, um, you made that recipe and you just left it like it was and you didn't strain it like and you cooked it long enough it would like kind of like uh turn into jam so this is also a very similar way of how i make uh strawberry jam as well so just a little like note about the syrups um yeah so on this on this coffee drink here's what we're working with we're going to be working with one shot of espresso we're going to be working with a half ounce of the strawberry syrup we're going to be working also with a little bit of beet powder. So the way the beet powder, um, the purpose of the beet powder is just to help really like flush out that pink color. So for those of you that have been to any of my classes or like have like seen any of my drinks, I like just love color. I like love presentation. I think that we like really inform ourselves of how we're going to enjoy something by our eyes and then like by our nose first before we actually taste anything. So my goal is to like put together something that's like both like really tasty, but also looks really nice. So the beet powder is going to add, um, a, um, a little bit of earthy kind of flavor to it. So you're just going to want to like use just a tiny bit. The goal is to like put a pop of color in there, not a bunch of flavor. So beet specifically does, it's got that like beady vibe going on. And so, um, yeah, just be, be cautious with it. Um, I see I have, um, a question about the syrup. So the syrup that I ended up with is like, um, I don't know if you can see this viscosity, but it really is, it's not like a sauce. So a sauce would be like a thicker, um, more gelatinous kind of, um, texture. This one, is a little bit um, less viscous than something like that. So the goal is that I could like pour it, I can work with it, um, things like that. If you made this and you ended up with something thicker, you can just use a thicker version. You could also like just put a tiny bit of water in it to, to like change the texture. Before you change anything though, I would taste it first. So if you taste it and it's like a little thicker, maybe than you want or a little thicker than what, what I have here. Um, I would just like taste it first as if it tastes great, you could try it out, see how it works, um, before you change something. So I'm a big fan of like tasting. Cause I think that like, 
If it tastes great, go for it. Thanks for the question. Um, great, so we've got our beet powder. And then I'm gonna be using almond milk today in my drink. Um, I love cow's milk, but I also think there's a lot of really fun plant-based beverages out there and I like to play around with them. I like to use them. I think they taste great and I think they work great. So I'm gonna be using almond milk today. And then I'm actually also gonna like throw a curveball into this and I'm gonna put just like a tiny spot of white chocolate right in the bottom of my cup just to help <clears throat> center my espresso. I like wanna add just like a little bit of balancing sweetness as well. So um, I think I love this drink as the ingredients are, but I'm also wanna put just a little bit more sweetness in mine today. If you're um, thinking about that sweetness or you wanna like add that little pop of chocolate in, you, you could put like just a little bit of like a chocolate sauce or a chocolate syrup in the bottom of this. Um, and it would be really great. It's also really great as the recipe is. Okay, last but not least, we'll be using espresso. So um, I'm using the Breville Barista Pro today. This machine is really awesome. It's one of my favorite um, home machines. It's got a built-in grinder and it's got like some just really great features with it. These machines always make really great coffee. I'm always super impressed when I'm using them. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I love Breville, but I have Breville machines at my house and they're really, really great. And I think that it's like, if you're into coffee and you like espresso and you're into doing it at home, that these machines are like worth like kind of giving it a shot or going to try one out um, somewhere at a store. Okay, so let's just talk just briefly about espresso. So I feel like every time I start talking about espresso, there's just like, there's so many things that we could discuss. Um, and a lot of folks are like really interested in learning all of those really specific nuts and bolts about espresso. Um, I love talking about that and teaching that. And that's not exactly what we're going to be going over today. But I'm just going to be talking briefly about how I'm making the espresso for, for this class. Um, so basically, I'm using like one of my kind of standard recipes for this machine and this coffee. The coffee I'm using is called Monarch, and it is a seasonal coffee blend that we put together at Onyx, and it is made for espresso. I'm using this particular coffee in this particular drink because the Monarch is the Monarch coffee is a little bit more developed than some of our other coffees. Just meaning that when we're roasting it, we are really drawing out all of those like sugars and like really pushing them into caramelization in the coffee which is gonna give this coffee like a really incredibly deep, nuanced flavor profile. So you're gonna get some caramels out of this. You're gonna get some really like deep, dark chocolates, a little bit of nuts. Um, and it's just gonna be super balanced. For me with this coffee, um, I just drink some as an espresso, just kind of like getting myself amped for the class. Also, a side note, like this is the drink I'm drinking right now, but I also have a cup of coffee over here and I also was drinking espresso. So it's OK if you have a bunch of drinks sitting around like you are not alone. Um, yeah, but this coffee, I typically really tend to enjoy it with milk or with something else. Um, but I just drank it on its own. It's been a little while since I've done that. And it was like really solid. Um, so my actual recipe that I'm using today, I'm going to be using 14 grams of coffee into my portafilter. The reason I'm using 14 grams is because this is a smaller size um, portafilter basket than a traditional machine would be. So this one is a 54 millimeter basket. Some of the Breville lineup has a 58 millimeter basket. If you go onto like on our website or you check out like other coffee guides, you're going to see things like 18 grams, 19 grams, 20 grams, things like that. And so part of the thing to remember about the differences here in some of these recipes for espresso is that depending on the coffee, depending on how much coffee you're making, depending on like what size basket your machine has is going to, to determine how much coffee you put in. I'm saying that not to like be confusing or not to like open the door to things that I like not going to answer right now in terms of like how to decide those things. But traditionally, like your thought process, like if you're at home and you're like, I don't really know how to like weigh 14 grams or 15 grams or whatever it is, is just thinking about like 
filling the basket all the way up and like having it a little bit over full because basically that is gonna get you really close to a good starting place for an espresso. I'm like a huge fan of making coffee in this like incredibly specific scientific way. I'm also like a really big fan of just making coffee and enjoying it. So if you're like thinking like, oh my gosh, I can't do it. I promise you, you can. So as I'm making this, I'm gonna show you about how much is in here. So if you're at home and you're like, I have no idea what size basket I have, like, don't worry about it. You can still make a great espresso shot. Okay. But before I make my, start making my espresso, what I'm gonna do is prepare for the drink. So I'm just gonna make sure I have all my ingredients ready. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by dosing out this almond milk into my steam pitcher. Because for this particular drink, I'm actually gonna steam the syrup and the ingredients with the almond milk itself. So um, I think my instructions that I sent out on my little card probably says something like to put the um, syrup into the cup. And so I've been playing with this drink a little bit more and really like when you get like a fruit syrup that you're working with or a fruit component, especially something that has some high acidity. So this particular uh, syrup recipe has that lemon juice in it. Um, it is like prone to curdling when it hits a hot liquid. So the way that you like work around that is by putting the syrup into the steam pitcher and just steaming it all together. I also want to steam the beet powder in here because I want it to completely dissolve. If you rely on like your espresso to like really stir that beet powder up, you're at risk of just like having some clumps in it. And so what I'm looking for is like a nice, um, the drink for the milk to be properly textured, for it to be sweet, for it to be smooth, for it to be harmonious with the espresso itself. And so I want everything like completely mixed up completely homogenized before I start even like making, uh, pouring it into the, into my cup. Okay. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to prep out my almond milk. I would love to know what kinds of milk you all use at home. You can put that down in the comments and somebody will send it over to me. I'm always super interested in these kinds of things. I get tons of questions about alternative plant-based, so if you have any of those kinds of questions, you could let me know. Okay, so now I've got my um, almond milk dosed out. I have about five ounces of almond milk in this steam pitcher. This is gonna be like more than I need for this size cup, um, but for me, I'm wanting to make sure that I get like a proper amount in here so I can steam it really well. Um, it won't be that much less left over, but it is a little bit more than I'm gonna need for this. Okay, so I've got a half ounce of the strawberry syrup pour in here. All right, and then I'm gonna put, this is gonna be really specific, but I'm gonna put like a quarter teaspoon and then a half of a quarter steep teaspoon of this um, beet powder into here. So again, you want to like get enough in there to make it pink, but not so much that it becomes a beet drink. Unless you love beets, unless you want a beet drink and then go for it. Um, okay, so now I'm ready with this. I'm also going to prep one more thing before I really start jumping into making this drink. Um, I'm going to like prep my strawberry because I'm going to like just... Um, adorn the side of the cup with the strawberry. Um, Y'all have probably seen the pictures of this drink and it was so fun making these drinks and shooting them. And we like worked real, this is a random story, but we worked really hard to make the drinks like really good and um, to put them together really well. And then during, while we were shooting the drinks, I like just could not stop looking at what felt like the most beautiful strawberry I'd ever seen on the side of the cup. And I was just like, of course, like we can work really hard to make all these beautiful things. And then this beautiful, like natural strawberry just felt like it outshone all of the work and artistry that we were trying to create ourselves. It was, it was actually a really beautiful moment. So anyways, um, before I start crying with that memory, I'm going to just, I'm just going to like put a little slice right down the middle of this strawberry. So this is like, if you're going to like work on garnishing anything, I mean, 
kind of the thought process here is like, I just want to make a little cut here. I'm going to put it about not quite halfway down, but far enough in that I can really like just stick this right on the edge. Um, my goal is that it like stays on the cup, that it looks really nice. Um, and that it just like is really easy for me to work with. Okay. So here's my strawberry. Um, last step here. I'm just going to put a little dose of this white chocolate right here in the bottom. So if you're at home and you saw me just do that and you're like, I literally have no idea how much this is. This is like less than a quarter ounce of white chocolate. It's just like a teeny tiny bit. Try to make it where you can see it here. Just a little bit in there. Okay. So now I just want to pause just for a moment and just talk about some of the measurements of these syrups. Um, and just like the way you can manipulate these drinks to like be more to your liking. So I've already got a half ounce of the strawberry syrup in here, which is pretty sweet. Um, and you should taste your syrups as you're making them just to see like how sweet is it? Because sweet is like a building block in, um, in a recipe, like sugar is a building block, salt is a building, building block. So if your strawberry syrup is like super sweet, you might not want to put chocolate in here. Um, if your strawberry syrup is like really nice and flavorful, but is not super sweet and you like sweetness, you could put chocolate in here to kind of like amp up the sweetness. Let's say you're just like all about sweetness and you're all in, like you can put a little more white chocolate, you can put a little more strawberry in here. You can kind of play around with these recipes to your liking. Um, I threw what I uh, made out to you on those recipe cards, just like as a starting point for making these drinks. So take that starting point, but then like make it what you want to make it. Okay, finally gonna make some coffee. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, push this in and I've got it set to like grind for me. So I'm gonna let it grind here. Awesome. Okay, so let's just take a look here at this. This is gonna be about 14 grams of coffee. Let's go back to the side view here. And so you can just see, I haven't done anything to it yet. Um, and you can see that it, a mound of coffee on the top. So part of why I want, I mean, I like have made this recipe so I know how much is in there, but part of why I want this like dome to exist is because once I get this all um, distributed and tamped down into the bottom, it's gonna be like, three millimeters, two or three millimeters from the top, which is not a ton, but really like what I'm hoping to achieve here is that when I start extracting my espresso and I put it into the machine, that there is like a little tiny bit of room between the group head, which is just the name for the place I put it in the machine and the coffee bed itself. Um, yeah, all right, so we'll go back to the side view here and I'm gonna show you a little bit about how to prepare this coffee. Um, also a sneak peek to this wine back here that we're gonna talk about in a second. It's five o'clock most places now, so get excited. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so now I've got this coffee and what I wanna do is prepare my coffee bed so that um, it's all ready to tamp. And this is just called distributing. There's like a lot of like tools out there for distributing. There's lots of different like methods of distributing. My method is just to like get it in the best way that I can. And what I want is for there to be a really smoothly distributed top to my um, espresso so that when I go to tamp it, um, it make a nice even coffee bed because I really want the water to come through uniformly. I want it to touch all of the grounds in here. I want it to extract evenly. Okay, so here's this, I'm gonna grab my tamper here going to hold it like a flashlight, This have this really incredible ergonomic situation going on, which is basically just like a straight up and down arm. And I'm holding it like a flashlight because I want to have the most even pressure I can. I'm going to press straight down. And you can see me moving there. I'm basically just like putting my body weight just like for a second onto the tamper. 
this typically nets itself out to about 40 pounds of pressure. Um, and so uh, sometimes people like get concerned about like how much is 40 pounds. And um, if you really want to like work it out, you can grab a bathroom scale and like do it and see how much 40 pounds is. But it's not as much as you think. It's really just like a here I am with my tamper. Push your body weight on it. That's going to be plenty. Okay. So returning briefly to my coffee recipe here, I've got 14 grams of coffee in. I'm going to pull approximately 40 grams of coffee out, which is going to net itself out to about an ounce on either side. This is a double shot. You can see I've hit my double shot here on the top. Okay. And I want this all to happen and extract and to come out around like 21 to 23 seconds. Um, and so you saw there was like kind of a gap of time there before the coffee started coming out after I hit the button. That's totally fine. There's not like a big parameter around like, okay, I've got this going on. Like how quickly should it come out? Don't worry about that at all. What you want is like to think about that final time. This stopped uh, coming out at about 20, 24 seconds, which I was kind of hoping for a slightly like shorter extraction, but it actually it looks incredible. It smells great. It's going to taste great too. Okay, so now we're ready to steam. And so what, what I want you to think about when we start steaming here is I'm basically going to put the steam wand into my um, steam pitcher. I'm going to, I want the steam wand and the milk to be at approximately a 90 degree angle. So you can see I kind of have it tilted a little bit and that's just because like for sizing and things like that I need to tilt it. Um, so I'm going to like put the seam on right in the middle of the pitcher, move it then a quarter of the way over to the side. And what that's going to do is like position the wand to put out steam um, that will then hit the bottom and come back up into the portafilter and create a rapid swirling motion um, for aeration. Aeration is just the term for putting all of the, um, sorry, aeration is just the term for putting air into the milk and creating foam. So that's all I'm doing here. One of the things that's gonna happen is like, as soon as I turn on my steam, uh, my steam wand is like, there's gonna be this pretty loud noise going on and that's gonna happen. It sounds like an airplane uh, screeching and that's gonna happen because I have not, allowed the seam wand to break the tip of the milk yet. The tip of the seam wand to break the surface of the milk. So once I do that, you're gonna hear it's gonna go away and then it's gonna end up with like kind of a sound. I'm doing that just because like, if we were here in person together, like you could put your face right down into the steam, uh, the steam pitcher and see exactly what's happening. Um, but the sound is like almost as important as what it looks like in the inside. So when you're doing this at home and you've got that really loud noise going down and you're like trying to figure it out, you just need to like pull the steam pitcher down just like this. See me like I'm just barely moving it and listen for the tip of the steam wand to break the surface of the milk. So essentially I'm going to just like then put my eyeballs inside of this, um, steam pitcher and make sure that I've got the rapid swirling motion. So I just want it to be going around in a circle. And then I'm going to leave the, uh, the tip of the seam wand close to the surface of the milk and allow it to like make that noise until the milk hits a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so how do you know it's a hundred degrees? Because when you're, you need to hold this, uh, handle with your hand and keep your other hand here over on the on the steam pitcher and when it gets too hot to touch you're at 100 degrees so your body temperature is hopefully 98 degrees your hand is going to be like a slightly lower temperature than that um, but then like as it starts to get hot it's going to feel pretty hot on your hand you're not all the way there yet you want to go to like close to 140 degrees so basically what I would do is like, I'll just like feel until it's too hot. And then I will like, just keep like touching it just slightly. It's going to be real hot. Um, 
for like four to five more seconds, depending on how hot you want it to be. Okay, wow, I've talked enough, so let's do it. Okay, so I'm in the middle, right in the middle of the scene picture. Now I'm a quarter of the way over. Now I'm gonna get this turned on. I'm just gonna wait for it to start steaming. It takes a second for the steam to come up into the steam wand. Here it comes. Okay, there's my loud noise. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna break the surface of the milk. So I just had to move my steam pitcher a little bit because it wasn't quite swirling the way I want it to. So you don't wanna move the steam pitcher too much because the way that the rapid swirling motion ha happens is not by you moving the steam pitcher itself, but by moving the angle of the wand inside the steam pitcher. Okay, so now I'm at 100 degrees. Two, three, four, five, six. Turn it off. Awesome. If you're like really super concerned about um, temperature, you can grab a um, you can grab a thermometer um, and just like stick it into your uh, into your milk and just kind of see like, okay, where am I at? And then like work to calibrate your hand to like, okay, this is what this feels like. It's 120 or it's 160 um, or whatever you want. But the, the standard for most places is going to be between 140 and 160. I am a 140 gal. I don't like to be things, things to be super hot. Um, let's see if we can get a little peaky inside this, um, inside this steam pitcher real quick. Nope. Hold. The magic of technology. I love it. I just want you to see the color of the milk before we start pouring it. And I also want you to see the texture. So kind of what I'm wanting out of this texture is I want the milk to be um, like slick, wet paint. And so what I'm doing right now, you can see I'm kind of like squirreling it around a little bit. And what I'm doing is I'm just wanting the milk and the foam to stay, um, to stay together until I pour it. So I'll just go ahead and show you here. You can kind of see it. It's really nice and pink. It's pretty great. Okay. So we'll go ahead and put this drink together. All right. So I'm just going to put one shot of espresso in here. This is like a relatively small cup. So... I think for balance, that one shot of espresso is great. You can see I've got a little bit of that white chocolate in the bottom there, and I'm just gonna give it a little stir. Just wanna get it kind of stirred up here a little bit, get it into the espresso. You can see what I mean by stirring it forever. Like if I had the beet powder in here, it would be pretty funny how much I would have to stir it. All right, let's go back to the side view here so y'all can see me pouring it in. This is my favorite part of the class. So you can get to see my latte art here. I'm not the greatest latte artist in the world, but you don't have to be to make great drinks. All right, here we go. All right, so you can see how nice and pink this is. Just gonna pour it all the way up. And as I get to the top here, I'm gonna get the steam pitcher as close as I can to the top of the foam and try to make the world's tiniest heart. All right. There we go. Here's the drink. So pretty right here. All right. So you can see as it's kind of settling out and when I say settling out, just like tiny bits of that foam are like starting to come, continue to rise to the top. Um, and, and it's a really nice pink color. I've got like a little bit of like little dot of pink foam on the top and I'm going to slide this on. Check out that strawberry seal on the show again. Tell you what. There you go. See it from the side here? Awesome. Cheers. <laughs> All right, before we move on to the next um, to the next drink, I want to just take a couple of questions. Um, or not just a couple, but I want to take questions. So anybody that has a question, if you want to comment it, and they'll send it over to me. Did I make the white chocolate sauce? I did not make the white chocolate sauce. 
Um, if you were going to make white chocolate sauce, you would, are, would use like cocoa butter and sugar and a little bit of water. And you would basically, I mean, this is not a great recipe, but you would basically like melt that cocoa butter, melt the sugar with it and really whip it and like until it got really nice and creamy and then you would be done. Um, that's essentially like how you make white chocolate sauce. Um, and yeah, straightforward. I should have made it. I know I did it. Thanks for the question, Tim. Um, are there any other questions about this drink or like about coffee or anything like that before we move on to the next drink? No. Okay. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to let this drink hang out here. I decided to make this drink first, even though it's a hot drink, um, because I think there's just like a lot involved in this drink. And in the second drink, there's not quite as much involved. And I just want to make sure I had plenty of time. All right. So now let's talk about the next drink. So the second drink um, is going to be a sparkling white wine. It's a really great wine. Um, and I made a cascara simple syrup to go with this. So let's talk about cascara. Cascara is essentially the cherry that surrounds the coffee bean. Um, when it is when it is pulped or from around the coffee bean, so that coffee bean can go through processing, which is basically just like the way that coffee goes from being like a seed in the middle of a plant to a stable green product that can be shipped across the world. Um, but basically that cherry is de-pulped. And then there are places that take that cherry and dry it and it becomes like a sort of a tea. And I say tea just because like it is dried and you are, if you're going to use it, what you need to do is like steep it um, and let that, let the cascara like will open up much like a tea will do. And um, it has like a really interesting kind of flavor to it. So the flavor it has, it's not as sweet as you might think. Um, it is like an earthy, um, slightly sweet from like the sugar content in those cherries. Um, but you kind of have to remember when we say coffee cherries, um, it's not like a cherry that you would eat here in the States. It's not cultivated for its actual fruit. It's cultivated for the bean inside. And so like, it's like a real, um, earthy, has an earthiness to it. It has like some sweetness, but it's not like a opened flavorful sweetness. It's like earthy um, and it's really, really good. I personally really love it. It's like a pretty mild flavor. And so to make the simple syrup, basically um, you put hot water and the cascara together. You put sugar in it. You let it steep, stir the sugar up really good. You let the cascara steep and then you strain it out and that's it. So it's basically like a super concentrated sweet tea. Um, and so the way that like these kinds of um, get ups, I say get ups like it's an outfit. Now the way these kinds of syrups end up being, um, end up being thick and so sweet is by the amount of sugar that you put in. So early on I made a cascara syrup um, and it was like, basically just like a super sweet tea and it wasn't very like viscous it wasn't very thick and I actually went back to my recipe and put less water in because I wanted it to be more potent I wanted it to be stronger I wanted the like viscosity to be heavier and part of that thought process is that like I didn't want it to like water down the wine if that makes sense um or water down like your coffee drink that you're putting it in um, so that's one of the things to think about with, with the, um, simple syrups that you're making is just like, if they end up being feeling like they're kind of watery when you're tasting them, just put less water in them and like maybe let the cascara soak a little bit more. You could also up the sugar a little bit, but that's going to like control that level of sweetness. It's going to control, um, the concentration. It also like influences like the texture, um, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's talk about this wine. So this wine is from a winery that I love, um, or it's actually not a winery, it's a wine group that I really like out of California called Field Recordings. And basically what they're doing is taking like unexpected um, 
grapes and unexpected styles of wine and putting them uh, putting them together in like these really uh, beautiful wine, different kinds of like wine products and wine uh, varieties of wine. So this particular one um, is basically just like called uh, California white field grapes. And so it's Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc and a little bit of um, Sauvignon Blanc grapes. Um, and it's basically what's termed as a pet nat. So a pet nat is, is a term for allowing the, um, the wine to ferment and carbonate in the bottle. So basically there is wild yeast that's put into this wine um, and then as it sits over time, it becomes like naturally like sparkling on its own. So as the like alcohol um, begins to, or as the sugar um, and the yeast becomes to interact, it's gonna like turn into alcohol. And that also the byproduct of that is CO2, which gets captured in the bottle and it makes it sparkling. So I picked this wine for this particular drink because it's super crisp. It's really light. It's called salad days because uh, they're like, oh, when you're out like um, eating tons of barbecue and you need a salad, you just go with the salad days. Um, so it's, it's light. It's got some really nice crisp apple kinds of flavors to it. And so it's also not a super expensive wine. It is a pretty nice wine, um, but it's not like ultra expensive. But really what I was looking for here is like something nice, light, tart and crisp to put with that earthy sweetness of my cascara syrup. Um, you really could make this drink with any sparkling wine that you that you like. So um, I know I like had put out there like a pet nut or a champagne. Champagnes are gonna be like a little bit cleaner in their flavor and a little sweeter just depending on what you have. Um, but really like anything sparkling and part of that is just because one, I love carbonation. I, you know, I'm like drinking my kombucha over here that's got tons of like really tight carbonation going on in it. And so for me, I just love carbonation. I love sparkling wine. So really anything that is sparkling, you could use. Um, I see that Vanessa's asking a question about a rose champagne as something to use in this drink. I would say absolutely that would be great. Um, and so what you want to, what you want to think through here is like, when you're adding something into a wine, what is the, the building blocks of those flavors? What are they going to give you? So you wanna make sure that like whatever you're adding in complements the wine flavors, creates new flavors, which can make a, like a completely different and potentially better experience than drinking just the wine on its own. So part of my thought process here is that this wine has that crisp, clean green apple like snap to it and so adding like earthy kind of sugary sweetness to it it actually creates a really nice like round balance to it so if you have a wine that's already like um this may be like heavier and maybe sweeter and then you add like an earthy sweet um syrup to it like does that make too much sweetness that's what you're gonna have to consider there is like, is it too much sweetness? Now, some of that just depends on like what kind of sweetness you, um, let's just say for example, I ended up putting, I mean, I don't know, I'm just gonna say like an apple syrup. I've never really had an apple syrup, but like an apple cider, let's say that. Like I put like an apple cider with this wine um, just for fun to see what it tastes like. Basically, like, because it has the same flavors in it, that apple cider would overwhelm this, and it would be, like, apple cider, right? So the thought process is, like, in creating the drinks that are balanced is to think about, like, what flavors are they bringing to the table? How do those flavors work together? Um, and then also consider, especially in this scenario, like, what kinds of sweetness is this um, wine and are the, is this syrup bringing to the table? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and open this. These wines are like super fun because um, they kind of function like champagnes, just meaning that when you open them, sometimes there's like some real excitement going on. So hopefully, like I wanna have it to be exciting, but I also like don't want it to fly everywhere. So it's got a nice little bottle cap on it. Um, it also has 
a cork. I want to tell a funny story that I just started thinking of while I started trying to open this, which is just that when I was in college, I was working as a barista and just like pouring drinks all the time and loved service. And somebody that was a customer there hired me to come like work at a party, which I used to do quite a bit of, and it was really great. And so I went, but like at the time, I mean, I was like, I was maybe like 21, but I didn't like have very much like wine experience. And so I like got given one of these little um, wine openers, st this style of wine opener. And I like literally had no idea what to do with it. And I like struggled to open wine all night and it was really funny. And the person that hired me was like, I can't believe you don't know how to open wine. And I was like, same. Anyways, fortunately, I was able to open it here, which is fun. Okay, so I've got my wine open. I'm going to let it, like, just kind of breathe here for a second. I'm going to go ahead and prep my drink by putting the Cascara Simple Syrup in. I'm just going to start with, like, a half ounce. Anyone, actually, I'm going to start with a quarter ounce on this one because, like, I don't want it to overwhelm the wine. All right, so I'm pouring it in here. And you can see that this, this like is kind of an interesting color. It's like a little bit deeper pink, kind of bordering a little bit on red. Um, that comes from the color of the cascara itself. Okay, so then basically the only thing left on this drink is just for me to pour the wine in. And then I'm gonna garnish it with this like beautiful flower. I'm like a huge fan of using flowers on, on drinks. I think it like gives it a really beautiful pop. Um, there's lots of really fun places that you can buy edible flowers from. Lots of natural grocery, grocery stores have them. Um, you can order, there's a place called Chef's Garden. That is a really place you, cool place you can order them from. You can just look them up online. You can order them all over the place. Um, all right, here we go. There's so many bubbles. This is why I love this wine. Funny awkward pause while I wait for the bubbles. Natural wines are really super fascinating to me because they are, all of this carbonation just came from the natural yeast that was uh, inside this bottle. And as it's just been sitting over time, like it's just been growing and growing, which is super cool. Um, that's like something kind of interesting about natural wines is that they're made to be drank young. So they're not really like uh, created to age because because that yeast is in there and is so wild, like it's just gonna like keep going until it is um until it's actually until it turns bad which is interesting all right i'm going to pour just a little bit more here in a second but i kind of want to like go ahead and line these two drinks up because i think that they look really beautiful together um, and then i'm going to like finish my garnish with this flower and it's going to really take up the whole top part of the drink um, you can use like all different kinds of Sizes of flowers, colors of flowers, all that kind of stuff. It really like just depends on what you're trying to achieve. All right. Finally, say, finally get to the top. Cool. Okay. Just going to toss this in. Just kidding. I'm going to pour it one more time. Thank you for your grace and patience, everyone at home. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And now I'm just gonna garnish this on the top. Perfect. So we can just take a look at these together. I love them together. And you can also see like the integrity of this um, warm cappuccino over here is kind of incredible. Like it looks exactly the same as when I poured it. Um, this is something I learned when I was working on making this drink is that it's like, um, I think it's the tightness of this like edge glass from Crate and Barrel, but like it really like keeps it beautiful for a long time. 
which is really fun. And then over here, like, I just like love this. I feel like if I came home on Valentine's Day and this was waiting for me, I'd be like super excited. Um, yeah. So, you know, just to kind of like give some final thoughts on these two drinks together and also on variations that you could have with these drinks. So basically, um, you could do the cappuccino as like a hot chocolate if you're someone that's like not super into coffee or you're thinking like, yeah, this is great for nighttime, but then like I don't want to be up all night because I just had an espresso. Um, so you could do it just completely without the espresso. Do that white chocolate in the bottom and make it a little hot chocolate, which is really fun. Um, you could also like make, um, make the wine like a non-alcoholic um, drink by using like just like a nice sparkling water. Um, there's like sparkling grape juices and things like that out there. Um, but just really anything sparkling. And you can see it's like super fun in these kinds of glasses to just see the action on this um, on these bubbles as they continue to continue to come up here. Super fun. Awesome. I really appreciate everyone joining me today. This has been really fun. Um, I'd love to hear any questions you might have about um, either one of these drinks, about the ingredients, or about, like, this machine or anything like that. Okay, someone's asking me about the wine. So the, um, the brand is called Field Recordings. I, like, love their lineup. They do, like, a really, really great job. It's a winemaker named Andrew Jones um, out of California, and he basically is just, like, um, cultivating wine, um, like wines that he loves and like, he does a really great job. Um, it's called salad days. Um, you can find these in whole foods. I've seen them in whole foods locally, but then as I've traveled, I've seen them in whole food, other whole foods. And, um, so I think this is like a decently accessible wine. Um, this one is not super pricey. I want to say it's like $15. I know that's a lot, but it's not like a hundred dollar bottle of champagne. Um, so this is a really great wine. It's super drinkable, um, like at dinner or it's great with food. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, what other kinds of questions do you all have? Shelf life on the syrups. Okay. So sh shelf life on syrups is like a really great topic because, um, I would say that like, if you... Are, if you don't have any, like, milk agents in them, so you don't have any, like, chocolate or anything like that, and you do include that citric acid, um, and you keep them in the refrigerator, I think that they can, like, solidly last for about a month. Um, I wouldn't, like, if you're going to go longer than a month on those, I would, like, think about, you know, smelling them, looking at them, tasting them, like, just making sure they're okay. Um, but really, they'll last for a while. So, I love that question because um, if you're wanting to do this at home and you're going to make two different syrups, you also could put the strawberry syrup in the wine. So you just make one, um, one syrup or you could do the cascara in the other one. Um, but if you're making these at home and then you're literally putting like a half ounce into this drink, I mean, you're going to have some left over. So um, for another time. So yeah, these will last, I could say confidently they'd last a month. They might last longer just depending on like what, all kinds of things are in them, but keep them in the fridge and that'll like make them last a long time. Just keep in mind if you're going to use them like in a hot drink or something like that, you might want to pull them out a little bit in advance and let them come up to room temperature just so it doesn't like mess with the temperature of your drink um, when you're putting them in. But yeah, you should be good for at least a month. Great question. Thanks. Um, what other kinds of questions do y'all have? Just put them in the comments. Oh, okay. What are the glasses? So this is something that Crate and Barrel sent to me, and it's like um, an edge champagne flute. So edge is like the style. I picked these because I just thought they were really pretty. I'm like kind of a big fan of just like standard like champagne flutes. But for me, these I felt like were like different enough to like just like be really eye catching, but not so like different that they you don't know what they are. Or like, you know, it's not too far out of the ballpark for me. Um, so I'm like a big fan of these. Um, I think they're, I think they're nice and classic and simple, but also like slightly different. They just like are eye catching. So thanks for asking. Okay.
Thank you all so much. Um, next month we'll be doing another class. Would love for you to join me. Um, the drinks are completely different from class to class. So I'm going to be doing it once a month um, through the month of June. I'm really excited for you all to be joining me here. And thank you so much. Thank you to Breville and Crate and Barrel for making this series possible. And you all enjoy your drinks. Um, if you make any of these drinks at home, tag Onyx Coffee Lab, Crate and Barrel, and Breville USA so we can see what you're making at home. And yeah, would love to see them there. Thank you.